This is Vietnam. That tropical river-infested jungle down there is the treacherous Mekong Delta. To the Tennessee Air National Guard crew, which has just fought its way through the fringes of a rampaging tropical storm, and to many other Air National Guardsmen, the Mekong has become a familiar sight. So has Saigon. It's Tan Sunat Airport dead ahead, and those flooded rice paddies hiding the elusive Viet Cong. Over the Mekong, it's not unusual for a crew to find itself the target of a VC barrage of small arms fire. Fortunately, the boys from Tennessee were not hit. Tan Sunat, it's a strange name in a faraway place. To many of our nation's men and women of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard, Tonsonut serves as an introduction to the war being fought in this corner of Southeast Asia. It's an impressive sight, all this activity. Reactions to it vary with the individual. Let's listen to this air guardsman explain how he felt. It's hard to explain. You get the feeling you're a part of all this back in the Philippines. When you leave there, you get a real good briefing on the situation in Vietnam. Except when you skirt the edges of a typhoon like we did today, the five-hour flight into Saigon is fairly routine. We're usually pretty tired because we've flown halfway around the world to deliver this cargo. No matter how tired you are, though, when you get over the Delta, everyone comes alive. It's just like someone pushed a button. I don't suppose there's more aerial activity anywhere in the world than there is in a combat zone. And brother, they sure got activity here. They say this is the busiest airport in the world, and boy, I believe it. You see almost everything here, all kinds of aircraft, some awaiting their call to combat and others returning from their combat missions. Equipment is all over the place. As a matter of fact, parking space is so critical that we unload and get right out of here to make room for others. We're parked by the tower this trip. That's only about 50 yards from the fuel storage area that was hit by a PC mortar attack the other night. We saw some of the planes that had been hit as we taxied in, too. The security is pretty heavy around here. They've got men, they've got radar, and they've got missiles. I know I wouldn't want to try to infiltrate this place. The Vietnamese help load and unload our aircraft here. They're a real friendly people and they do a fine job. We hope, of course, that all these workers are our friends, but I guess you never really know. Look at that. That's pretty unusual. I guess that chopper is bringing it back for repairs. Boy, she really got banged up. For us National Guardsmen, these missions to Vietnam are rewarding experiences. In my books, every guy over here is a patriot in the finest American tradition. Now, these missions to Vietnam are only part of the National Guard story. We can't tell you all about the Guard in a few minutes. However, this film is intended to show you a few activities the 400,000 Army Guardsmen and 80,000 Air Guardsmen perform. Take this aeroplane, for instance. It looks like any other C-97. You might describe this one as something round and silver with a voice that can be heard around the world. This is the Oklahoma Air National Guard's talking bird. Now, they call it that because it has radio and communications equipment for worldwide operations. This plane remains on four-hour alert at all times. Comes a crisis anywhere in the world, and these boys might be on their way. That was the case during the 1965 crisis in the Dominican Republic. Talking Bird was one of the first planes ordered into Santo Domingo. It has a wide range of versatility, this bird. These capable guardsmen can land in a remote area anywhere in the world and relay conversation from a walkie-talkie in a foxhole directly to the Pentagon. This is Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, along with Vietnam and the Dominican Republic, another trouble area of the world. The Air Guard flies into this outpost in the Caribbean regularly. As a matter of fact, in the past year, the Air National Guard has taken over a significant part of the aeromedical evacuation flights for the Air Force. Cuba is one of the many offshore locations served by the Guard. Guarding against infiltration is a 24-hour-a-day job. It's an unheralded job, but it's one that these Marines take as seriously as duty in Vietnam. All of this only 90 miles from Florida.
minefields, barbed wire fences, a no man's land, outposts that remind one of Korea. That's what it's like here. On one side, we have our outposts. On the other, they have theirs. We watch them, they watch us. The seas are not an unfamiliar element to the Army National Guard. The boats you see here in these log-filled waters around Tacoma belong to the Washington Army National Guard. These guardsmen wear the Army green, but in their hearts, they're as salty as a sailor. Whether it's on the bridge or on the deck of these floating machine shops, tugs, utility and landing craft, these guardsmen are expert seamen. And although their mission is primarily one of combat support, their importance in natural disasters makes this outfit a valuable asset to the entire West Coast. Their flotilla is unique, the only one in the National Guard. Now, these sailors in green are shoving off on a landing exercise with other Guard troops. Time and tide make little difference to these seagoing soldiers. Plowing through the frigid and choppy waters of Puget Sound, they observe strict radio silence. The fact that guardsmen serve their community and state as well as their nation makes the guard unusual in itself. In other words, these men swear allegiance to both state and nation, and thus the National Guard is the only military force, and let me emphasize that, the National Guard is the only military force immediately available to a governor or a community in the event of a raging tornado, a rampaging flood, a fierce forest fire, or any other civil emergency. That's quite an asset for Americans to have. Sort of bonus they get with the National Guard that they don't enjoy with any other reserve program. Although the Guard has its responsibility to the state and community, it trains primarily to meet its wartime mission. And in any war, there's always a high priority for linguists, folks who can speak foreign languages. They're needed to read enemy documents, to interrogate prisoners, for many other duties. Well, the National Guard isn't sitting by the roadside and watching things pass by on this score either. Here's a group of Utah Army Guardsmen in their foreign language laboratory. They're involved with some Mandarin Chinese, and that's one of the toughest dialects in that language. Let's listen. This guard linguist company has capabilities in 18 different languages. Now, it's interesting to note that 94% of the men in this unit have served missions overseas for the Mormon Church. In doing that, they lived in the countries they were serving. They learned the language fluently. They became very familiar with the people, with their customs, with the geography of the country, with the climate. That's on-the-job training of the highest order, believe you me. And the high caliber of men in this outfit is typical of the individual dedication and determination that is found throughout the National Guard. Now, these linguists don't spend all their time in the laboratory by any means. They're no chair-bound doughboys, these fellows. On a weekend, they might be out working closely with an Army Guard Special Forces unit, the proud Green Berets. Well, the Guard has them too, you know. Here's some of the Utah Special Forces outfit getting ready for a night parachute drop for an exercise the next day. They're a rugged-looking bunch. They're tough, too. A special breed that demands a pocket full of courage and a heaping dose of physical stamina. And the guard has something else special, too. Those waves skipping across the coral reefs of Puerto Rico are washing directly toward an aggregation known as the Buccaneers. They're special because they make music from 55-gallon oil drums. You know, you take a few of those drums and you cut them down, you beat them up a little bit, then you temper them, and you have a steel drum band. And when you have a steel drum band, you have, well, give a listen. 
fighter pilots make a different kind of music. That music is the thunder and roar of an F-86 jet fighter. Like all the Air Guard's 22 air defense units, they maintain the watch every day in the year, standing alert just like their compatriots in the active Air Force. In standing alert, these guardsmen are ready to get into the air in just a few minutes. If an unidentified plane approaches, they go up to check it out. So far, they've all been friendly. For an enemy to show up, however, these planes are armed for battle. These guardsmen are the first line of defense. Guard radar station maintains a 24-hour year-round vigil of the skies surrounding the island. It's a dreary, lonely job, but it requires professional competence of the highest order. Life is more exciting for these pilots, but their jobs are just as important. All guardsmen, whether they're in Puerto Rico, New York, Nebraska, Arkansas, California, Hawaii, or any other state, are professionally trained citizen soldiers and citizen airmen. These Puerto Rican Army National Guardsmen trace their heritage back to the famous explorer who searched for the Fountain of Youth, Ponce de Leon. Actually, he established military forces here long before he started his search for the fountain, and a whole century before the first settlers set foot in Virginia. Just as the Air Guardsmen are the first line of defense in the air, these Army Guardsmen are the only ones immediately available for the ground defenses of that island. With a responsibility like that, intensive training is a must. So it is, too, with the famed 28th Infantry Division of the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. The 28th is part of the selected Army National Guard and Reserve Force, or SRF as it's called. The SRF was formed as a result of the mounting tension in Southeast Asia and is composed of 150,000 Army Guardsmen and Reservists, 119,000 of which are Guardsmen. All the combat elements of that select force, as a matter of fact, the three infantry divisions, the six infantry brigades, an armored cavalry regiment, and other combat support units are National Guard outfits. Through increased manning, more equipment, and accelerated training, these SRF units have given the nation a ready force unequaled in our history. These helicopters are part of the Guard, too. Both the Army and Air National Guard have programs under which qualified young men can train to be pilots. These Hawaiian Army Guardsmen, for example, are flying a routine patrol along the beautiful shores of Hawaii. In Hawaii, the Army and Air Guard team together provide the primary defenses for the island. Army Guard Nike Hercules batteries, such as this Hawaiian unit, regularly establish new records for missile firing accuracy and professionalism. These guardsmen carry out their practice firings right from their island stations in Hawaii, a built-in advantage to living in a paradise like this. Guardsmen protecting the key industrial complexes in the continental United States usually go to New Mexico for their practice firings. All these 
Guard are on round-the-clock alert at all times. Missiles are among the most complex, sophisticated weapons in our nation's defense inventory. The Guard's teamwork and precision timing lend that necessary assurance so comforting to the people who once suffered the indignities of a sneak attack. Supporting the Hawaii Nike Hercules defenses is the Hawaii Air National Guard and its F-102 jet interceptors. These guys scramble into the wild blue like a surfer takes to Waikiki. The heavy responsibilities given the guard and the obvious confidence the nation's strategists place on guardsmen is a comforting testimony to the guard's readiness and capability. That's the story of the National Guard, really. It's a trained, professional force that can and does do almost anything. These F-105s, for example, belong to the New Jersey Air National Guard. <laughs> They're some sort of whistle buggies. They can carry more bombs than many of what we called our big bombers in World War II. One of the pilots in this flight was Captain Jim Butler. He flew missions over North Vietnam in an active Air Force F-105 outfit a short time back. When he got out of the service, he signed up with the airlines. But he keeps his weekends for these supersonic stallions. He's typical of the combat-tested men in the guard, and he provides an additional element of up-to-date combat experience which he can share with his fellow guardsmen. How's this for a voice of authority? Those guns spit out 6,000 rounds a minute. Listen. With the help of aerial tankers, these fighters can be dispatched to any point in the world in a matter of hours. These jets are active Air Force F-105s exemplifying once again the teamwork that exists between the National Guard and the active military forces. These aerial tankers are a relatively recent addition to the Guard inventory. They've proved their importance time and time again, however. In an exercise in 1964, these guard tankers teamed up with guard jets and moved to Europe in a mere nine hours. Well, as a rule, guardsmen aren't found short of ingenuity. And it has to be ingenuity when there's something like this. These are some Illinois Army Guard infantrymen from the 33rd Division teamed up with a tank element of the Wisconsin Army Guard in a recent field exercise. These ground units are requesting assistance from their brother guardsmen in the air. It has an unusual ring, this request, because, well, the Army tanks are running low on fuel and there's not a drop within miles of this area remote from everything except an abandoned airstrip. Are they in trouble? Not with their Skyborne gas station around. Perimeter defenses are established while the flyboys rig the refueling nozzles. And in a matter of seconds, the aircraft is supplying the tanks with vital fuel. In addition to these tankers, other tactical air command elements of the Guard include 23 fighter, 12 reconnaissance, and four air commando groups, plus many other non-flying units which play an important role in providing support in radar, communications, electronics, and weather. Nine F-100 tactical fighters, four RF-84F tactical reconnaissance units, plus a tactical control group have been placed in an accelerated training status similar to the program being carried out by the Army Guard SRF units. This bond in the Guard between the Army and the air and between one state and another 
is indicative of the determination that is so prevalent in guard ranks from the bottom to the top. It's a great system, and it's a system that works, too. Hey, you guys, you forgot your green stamps. Talking about tigers in your tank, listen to the growl of these Colorado Air National Guard F-100s. They're setting out on a mission to support the Army's 5th Division at Fort Carson. Now, this will be a simulated combat exercise, but it sounds like real. The conversations you'll hear now are the communications that were established between a forward air controller on the ground, an observation plane in the air, and the pilots of the Air Guard Super Sabres. pretty nice compliment. It's a friendly confirmation of a job well done. And talking about good jobs, let's take a look at the Army and Air National Guard in Alaska. Here again, they work closely together, particularly with the Guard's Eskimo scouts, who prowl the Arctic the year round, reporting anything unusual they see. In this exercise, they've spotted something. Now, after reporting, they move by what is the army term for dog sled? Other units of the Alaska Army Guard are in the field too and they move into action. That is until you try it in snow about three feet deep in the shallow places. Yeah, but these men are from a hardy stock, and this jaunt is about the same as a Sunday stroll to them, only with a much graver purpose. Having reached the scene, it's a short jog to their point of link up with the other troops. Then it becomes a lonely vigil of sweating it out, trying to become an inanimate part of the surrounding countryside, just waiting for the next move, whatever it might be. If 
If the situation dictates a call for reinforcements, they're available also, and they travel by Alaska Air Guard ski-equipped C-123J aircraft. Right now, the reinforcements have only one purpose, to get where they're needed fast as this bird can get them there. It's a rugged aircraft just made to order for the challenge of Alaska's lusty terrain. The fact that citizen airmen and citizen soldiers of the National Guard can perform duties that you have seen in this film should serve as evidence of the Guard's important and growing role in national defense. The scenes here have depicted some of the unusual aspects of the National Guard about which most folks are unaware. They should not cloud the fact that there are many other Guardsmen in many other units in many other locations with equally important missions and who, as the men you have seen in this film do, stand ready to defend their country. They've been that way now for more than 300 years. It took that long to write a creed like this. I blooded Bunker Hill and froze at Valley Forge. I rode with Washington across the icy Delaware. I saw the making of a nation, for I am the guard and I was there. I swam the flood to take a child in my arms, then watched her tears melt away. I fought through snow and I felt the twister blow. I know what it means to pray. So raise the flag I love and this to you I swear that I will follow though the road may lead me anywhere. I am defender of our nation. Now and forever I am the guard. I fought at Normandy and in Korean skies. I heard the battle call. I flew the missions to keep peace around the world so freedom could reign for all. So raise the flag I love and this to you I swear that I will follow though the road may lead me anywhere. I am defender of our nation. Now and forever, I am the guard. I am